Okay, well, good morning, church family. Today, we are going to pause from our study in the book of Colossians to consider a question that was asked almost 2,000 years ago today. It was the question of utmost importance to the original audience, and it remains the question today of utmost importance for every living human being. Now, it bears this singular gravity because how you answer this question determines how you will spend eternity. And the Bible tells us there are only two options. The first is that you can spend it in eternity in personal and intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven, or you will spend it eternally separated from Christ in conscience torment in a place the Bible calls hell making the question not only important, but also urgent. Now, the event from which this question arises is recorded by all four of the Gospel writers, but today we're going to look at the version presented to us by Matthew in his Gospel. So if you would turn, please, in your Bibles to get Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, and verses 1 through 11. So Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And I've titled this message today, Who is this? To which I've appended the word man. And I've done that because this very question is going to be asked at the climax of our text here this morning. Verses 1 to 11 report the events associated with Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem for the Passover, which will turn out also to be the last week of his earthly life, which we commonly refer to as the Passion Week culminating with Jesus' death and, importantly, his triumphant resurrection, which we'll look at next week. Now, our passage today carries one of the Bible's most misleading and poorly labeled section headings, which is living proof that pastors all think alike, because Pastor Chuck already shared this, and I think very rightly so, Um, which we should remember, by the way, that these headings are added to the text. So look at your Bibles for a minute. And tell me, what heading does your Bible have for this section in Matthew? What headings do you have? Triumphal entry, entry, right? Every English version that I could find, all of the Chinese versions, all report this event as the triumphal entry. And as Pastor Chuck shared, as he shared the Lord's table with us, we're not going to find any triumph in our passage here today. Rather, what we will find is an abject failure to recognize who Jesus is, despite it being made abundantly clear by Jesus himself and by his meticulous planning of the event that is recorded in these verses. So if you would please follow along in your Bibles with me, and I will read this account in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And then they approached, uh, I'm sorry, and when they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And this took place in order that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a pack animal. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their garments on them. And he sat on the garments. And most of the crowd spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. 
Now, since we're parachuting into this passage in the middle of a narrative in Matthew's Gospel, I want to start by setting the scene. As I said to you just a moment ago, the event recorded in verses 1 to 11 inaugurates the last week of Jesus' earthly life, and it coincides with the Passover celebration. Jesus had been ministering in Galilee, and now he is on his final trek to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now look back at chapter 20 here just for a second in verse 29. It reports that Jesus was leaving Jericho, and a large crowd was following him. And on the way out of town, he performs a final miracle, healing two blind men. Note in verses 30 and 31. And behold, two blind men were sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. But the crowd sternly told them, be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, what I want you to note about what these two blind men said is their emphasis on this title for Jesus, the son of David. And it's important, as we lead into our passage today, to recognize that, because this is an acclamation of Jesus' messianic title. Son of David is an acclamation of Jesus' messianic title. So, as they're leaving Jericho, Jesus passes through Bethany, which you know is the home of Matthew, Martha, and Lazarus, and where Jesus will stay during the Passion Week. And he arrives at Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, which is about three kilometers from Jerusalem. So here's just a quick picture of that with a little bit of typological, what do you call it when you go up and down? Topography, typological, that's something entirely different. Topography, excuse me. A little bit of topography, right? So they're coming first south and then from the east. They pass by Bethany, which is on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. They traverse up the Mount of Olives Okay, they come to this small city, Bethpage. We also know the Mount of Olives is the scene of two momentous events, the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is actually arrested, as well as where he gave the Sermon on the uh, uh, the Olivet Discourse, which we find in Matthew 24 and 25. Now, upon their arrival at Bethpage, Jesus will very deliberately initiate And then he's going to act out a series of events whereby he is going to unequivocally pronounce himself to be the Messiah. Now this is significant for a lot of reasons, but the two that are relevant for us today are this. The first that I want you to see is how precisely Jesus plans and portrays the uh, revelation of his identity. And the second is the point of the pronouncement, which is also the main point of the passage today, and that is that Jesus' identity demands a decision. Jesus is going to identify himself, and his identity is going to demand a decision. Now remember, up to this point in his earthly life, Jesus had either downplayed or concealed his identity as the Messiah. As he performed miracles, as people responded to that, he often instructed them, don't say anything, because it's what? Not the time for that to be revealed. Well, now it is the time, and in one short and profound event, Jesus is going to lift the veil, and he's going to unmistakably reveal who he is. And what makes the pronouncement so interesting is that Jesus never actually says he's the Messiah. He never actually states it in this entire section. Rather, he's going to reveal his identity by his actions, which perfectly fulfill Old Testament prophecy, leaving it to the audience to draw their conclusion and to make their decision. So with this background, let's now look a little closer at these verses 1 to 11. And based upon the events, I think a far better label for this section would be the royal procession, which is what we're going to call it today, the royal possession, procession. There are three acts to this short dramatization, as Jesus pronounces himself. Act one, we find in verses one to five, where Jesus will plan the procession, 
Then Act 2, in verses 6 to 9, we're going to see the pageantry, or the actual procession itself, and then closing in verses 10 and 11, we're going to see the point of the procession. So we're going to see first the planning, Jesus himself as the planner. We're going to see the actual enactment or the pageantry flowing out of that planning. And then in the closing two verses, we'll see the point of this whole event. Now, as we look at the planning for the procession, I want you to notice three things. First is who the planner is. Okay, it's Jesus himself. Jesus himself is planning and orchestrating every detail of this event. The second is the amazing precision in the planning, with every detail specifically orchestrated by Jesus. And then thirdly is the explanation of the details. Matthew does not allow for the disciples or us as his readers today to be left with any question about Jesus' purpose for this royal procession. Matthew will say it is a direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that foretold of this exact event, making it undeniably clear that Jesus is the Old Testament's prophesied and promised King and Messiah. And in fact, the reason I picked this version from Matthew's Gospel is this is the entire theme of his gospel. Matthew is writing to Jews, and his singular purpose is to demonstrate to the skeptical Jewish people that Jesus is the promised king, the promised excuse me, Messiah that was prophesied clearly in the Old Testament, which we remember for the Jews would have been their Bible. Now, Jesus is Israel's king, and Matthew's going to rely heavily on the Old Testament to present his case. So let's look at some of the details. Looking first at Jesus' instructions in verses 2 and 3. Now, it says, as Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem, that Jesus commands two of them to enter a village and procure provisions for the actual royal procession. His command in and of itself is not terribly significant. He says, hey, go find into the city, see a donkey, grab the colt, untie him, bring him back to me. But what is of note is what Jesus displays through these instructions or the initial clues that he starts to lay down about his identity. First, in verse 2, Jesus precisely describes the scene that the two disciples he sends will find. So note, you've got to pay attention, will find. Future tense verb, okay? Precisely what they'll find when they enter the village. Now how does Jesus know this? Well, by means of one of the attributes of his deity, right? Namely, his omniscience, which is Jesus' all-knowing nature. He knows everything that has occurred, He knows everything that is occurring, and he knows everything that will occur. Now, um, uh, in verse 2, we also have an allusion to the Old Testament. Now, there are two things that the New Testament will do with the Old Testament. One is an allusion. And what allusion means is that there's something in what's said that would draw the reader's attention to something that was written in the Old Testament. It's different from a citation which specifically recites or cites a specific Old Testament passage. The illusion that these, uh, this crowd would have understood is found in Genesis. So turn back to Genesis if you would be, please. Genesis chapter 49. And what we're going to see, this is... Um, Uh, the blessing of his sons as he's dying. And we're going to see the second um, messianic prophecy in the Bible, the first being in Genesis 3.15. And now here in chapter 49, Jacob is blessing his sons. And in verses 10 to 12, he says this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So that's a reference to 
one of the tribes and from which tribe the Messiah is going to come. The scepter is a sign of ruling. Nor the ruler's staff are between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now here's the illusion part. Verse 11. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes were dark from wine and his teeth were white from milk. Now remember, the Old Testament was their Bible. They knew it far better than we know it. They would have picked up on this illusion. What does it say exactly in verse 11, right? Not only just the foal, right? The, 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 the baby of the mother donkey, but the donkey's colt and it's going to be tied up to a choice vine. So the first thing we see in this instruction is an illusion in addition to his omniscience. So Jesus lays down two clues as to his identity. Now, so by describing both of these, he is giving us some clues of who he is. Okay, now back to Matthew 21. Turn back, if you would please, to Matthew 21. And there is more. In verse... Three, Jesus is going to anticipate an objection that the disciples might encounter. And he tells them how to handle it. Namely, he tells them that if anyone inquires as to why they're taking these animals, they're to respond by saying, the Lord has need of it, and they will immediately comply. Okay, the Lord has need. Now, by his certainty of their compliance, Jesus is displaying yet another aspect of his deity, and that is his absolute sovereign authority over everything, another clue. Now, um, what Matthew records doesn't necessarily um, prove my assertion, but let's turn over to Mark's account of this event. And we can see that this sovereign authority is indeed um, is responded to. So turn to Matthew, I'm not sorry, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 and verses 5 and 6. Mark reports this. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing untying this colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them. And they gave them permission. And they brought the cult to Jesus and put their garments on it. Okay, so now each of the different authors report different aspects of these events. But we can see through Mark's account, turn back if you would to Matthew, um, that in fact Jesus has anticipated correctly. And they're going to respond precisely as Jesus said. The Lord needs it. Immediately they release them to the Lord. So we have three clues to Jesus' identity. We have his omniscience, his all-knowing nature, his sovereignty, and this allusion to the Old Testament prophecy in Genesis 49. But just in case you missed it, Matthew speaks plainly in verses 4 and 5, and he starts in verse 4 by saying, this took place. Well, what took place? Everything that Jesus had just instructed and planned in verses 2 and 3. And they took place, Matthew goes on to say, for an important reason. And that was to fulfill a specific Old Testament prophecy, which Jesus now cites in verse 5. The words of verse 5 are found in the prophet Zechariah's book in the Old Testament. So turn back with Matthew. Just go back to the beginning of Matthew. For the last Old Testament book is Malachi, the last of the 12 minor prophets. Right before Malachi is Zechariah. So turn back, Malachi, Zechariah, chapter 9, and verse 9. Okay, so Matthew, under divine inspiration, of the Holy Spirit is going to say that Jesus' instructions are a direct fulfillment of this prophecy. So note what Zechariah says in verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Make a loud shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. 
He is righteous and endowed with salvation, lowly and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a pack animal. Okay, back to Matthew. So what we have here, Matthew is telling us, is a direct fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy about the coming Messiah. It's almost as if Jesus is wearing a neon sign and he is shouting at the same time, look at me, here I am, I am the promised Messiah. But at the same time, there's something very interesting about Matthew's citation of Zechariah 9.9. I'm going to put the verses on the screen here, and let me see if you can pick out what is interesting about Matthew's citation of this verse. What do you see? What's that? Yeah, okay, so it's slightly different, right, in the first line, right? What else? Right, so we have some things that match. What else? Huh? Ah, there you go. That's a pretty important one, isn't it? All right, now, note, first of all, what he does is he kind of crunches the first two things, and he cites this, say to the daughter of Zion. That actually comes from Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 11. But the big deal, okay, the big deal is that Matthew does not include this line. He is righteous and he is endowed with salvation. Now, any guesses as to why he doesn't do that? Why doesn't Matthew include that? All right, so what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. He left out the part that Israel was looking for. What was Israel looking for in the Messiah? They were looking for a conquering king that would save them from Roman rule. He drops that line. That's what that reference is. He's righteous and endowed with salvation. Okay, salvation, rescue, saving. We hear that word and we always immediately jump to our being saved in Christ. But it's a general word. It says he's righteous and, um, and endowed with a rescuing. Okay? So Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he wrote this, did not include that line for a very simple reason. It's not going to happen, is it? So thus, why is the triumphal entry such a wrong name? Well, no triumph over Roman rule at this point in time. He leaves it out. But instead, what is he emphasized? That Jesus' purpose in this first coming was to humble himself, which will be expressed by his upcoming humiliation on the cross on our behalf. Now, Matthew points to something far more important than overthrowing a temporal earthly kingdom. He points to Jesus triumphing over sin and eternal death. And brothers and sisters, this is a stunning revelation. Jesus came precisely as it was prophesied, only with a twist at this first coming. And that twist is captured by Mark. In chapter 10, verses 45, where he says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So in verses 2 and 3, Jesus has now provided clues to the identity of himself through the planning of the procession. And in verses 4 and 5, he has confirmed these plans as fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And this really should be enough to make our head spins at this point in time. The amount of meticulous detail that Jesus has laid down. But there's really one other Old Testament prophecy that I want to draw your attention to. It's not explicitly in our text here today. But again, knowing their Old Testaments, this would have come to mind. So, let's go back to the Old Testament again. Let's go to the prophet Daniel. The prophet Daniel. Okay, so Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 9 and verses 24 to 27. Daniel chapter 9 
24 to 27. Um, now, in this chapter, Daniel, if you recall, is praying. He's recognized that the time for their exile is up the 70 years, and he's asking God for what's next. God sends an angel to answer his prayer in verses 9, uh, 24 to 27, and here's what he says. Seventy weeks have been determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Holy of Holies. So you are to know, he's talking to Daniel, and to have insight that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, this is a reference to the rebuilding under Nehemiah, um, uh, until Messiah, the Prince, Jesus, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks it will be restored and rebuilt with plaza and moat even in times of distress, speaking of the temple. Then after the 62 weeks, here's the key thing, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come, who's that? Present ruler of our age, Satan. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come like a flood. Even to the end, there will be war desolations and so forth. Okay? So, um, back to, to uh, Matthew for a minute. Um, what I want to point out by pointing this is that this procession not only occurs exactly as it is prophesied in detail, it also occurs precisely when it was supposed to happen. Now, I don't have time to take you through proving all this. It's a wonderful prophecy. Maybe someday we'll get to it. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus spoke specifically about the details of what would happen, and he spoke precisely when it would happen. So Jesus' entry into the city was a triumph in the sense that it occurred precisely when it was prophesied to happen. So when I pair these things together, both Daniel 9.24 and Zechariah 9.9, we see absolute proof of the Bible's absolute trustworthiness. Namely, that Jesus arrived for his crucifixion in exactly the way it was prophesied that he would, humble and riding on a donkey, and he arrived at the precise time that he was supposed to arrive, which is what Daniel's prophecy tells us. So, what do you think? Is the Bible accurate? Can we trust in this? You bet we can. Right? The Bible is absolute truth. Well, let me summarize this all, all in the same way that Paul summarizes it when he presents his gospel that was given to him in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Everything associated with Christ's life, death, and resurrection, Paul says, occurred, anybody know the next phrase? According to the scriptures. And in like manner, everything associated with Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem at this particular moment and all the minute detail occurred according to the scriptures. Nothing is happening that wasn't foretold would happen, and now it is occurring. And yet, people still miss the truth about Jesus, just as this once adoring crowd is going to do in verse 11. But for those of us who have genuinely placed our faith in Christ, these verses and their truth should be an unshakable source of confidence and assurance. We have a God who both does what he promises and has the power to bring it about. Well, with the arrangements made, the royal pageantry comes next. And we find this in verses 6 to 9. So let me just read those again to refresh our memory. 21, 6 to 9. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their garments on them. And he sat on the garments. And most of the crowd spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And the crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were crying out, saying, 
Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So in verses 6 and 7, Matthew reports that the two disciples did in fact fulfill their task, and they readied the colt for Jesus to ride. And now in verse 8, we see the crowd gets into the act by also preparing the way, laying their garments in the road, which is what you would have done in a royal procession. They said they were cutting branches. This is where we get the name Palm Sunday from. Laying them in the road is a sign of their submission to this king that's coming. And, uh, and, and that's all important. But the real significance of this section we find in verse 9. And here again we see another Old Testament citation. And this one comes from the Psalms. So let's turn to Psalm 118. Psalm 118 and verse 26. Psalm 118 and verse 26. Now, Psalms 113 through 118 were called the Hallel Psalms, which was shorthand for Hallelujah, which simply means praise. And they were traditionally sung at Israel's main festivals, and particularly at the Passover. They praised God by remembering his greatness and his covenant care for the nation and the people of Israel. And here they're going to do so in acknowledging what they're seeing. So 118 verses, I'll read 25 and 26. It says, O Yahweh, save, O Lord, I'm sorry, you probably have, O Lord, save, O Lord, succeed. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And it goes on. So the significance of this, turn back to Matthew if you would, is this. This citation and their saying it demonstrates that the crowd completely understood the symbolism of Jesus' actions. Because their hallelujah, their praising of him, was acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. So Matthew includes this to tell us that they understood what Jesus had been acting out in these verses. Now, should we have any doubt about their understanding, a quick appeal to Luke's gospel will help us. So turn to Luke's account of this, Luke chapter 19 and verses 39 and 40. So Luke 19, 39 and 40. Luke also, as I said, all four gospel writers report this event. Luke reporting on this event says in verses 39 and 40, right? Well, let me start at 38. So 38, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, citing the same verse. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And here's what the Pharisees say. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would cry out. Okay, so turn back to Matthew 21. The bottom line is that they knew what this acclamation meant. It proves that they understood without any doubt what Jesus was claiming to be by this royal procession and the details of that procession. Now note also that the citation is sandwiched between one other acclamation of Jesus as Messiah and then one acclamation for their desire of Jesus' arrival. First note before it says what? They say in verse 9, And the crowds going ahead of them, and those who followed were saying, crying out, Hosanna to who? Son of David. Okay, what's that a reference to? Again, the Messiah, just as the two blind men had done previously at the end of chapter 20. So, Hosanna. And the next part uh, is what they hoped for. They say, Hosanna in the highest. What they're expressing by that is, Hosanna means, oh, save. That's simply what it means. Oh, save us to the highest. They're expressing what they wanted, which was a desire for Jesus as the conquering king. So 
it not only expresses his identity, but it also expresses what they wanted to have happen. They wanted this conquering king who would overthrow Roman rule. They had wanted no part in a suffering servant who was going to come and die for their sins. And this brings us to our final two verses in 10 and 11. Note again that Matthew, what Matthew records. He says, And when he had entered, of course referring to Jesus, Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? Here's our question. Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. So really, all of verses 1 to 9 have been building to these final two verses. And in verses 10 and 11, we find the climax and the central point of this entire event. Namely, that Jesus' pronouncement of his identity demands a decision. And this is what I said when we started today. It demanded a decision from Matthew's original audience, and it demands a decision from us today. So the procession, the procession has arrived, they've entered the gates, and Matthew says the city is stirred up. Seems like a little bit of an understatement. Stirred up. No, I think they were in absolute frenzy and uncontrolled excitement about what they thought was going to happen. And that excitement then prompts a question that every human being needs to answer, consider and answer, and that is, who is this man? Who is Jesus? Now the question was asked by the people who were stirred up. So you've got to kind of keep track of the crowds here. There's the crowd coming along with them. There's the crowd in Jerusalem. They're all stirred up by this ruckus of Jesus coming in. And they ask this question, who is it? And it's answered by the people who had been traveling with Jesus. Okay, so we see in this the absolute irony of this passage. The ones who had seen everything, who had understood it by means of the proclamation that they got, and were proclaiming the truth, got it wrong at the moment of truth. They had the perfect opportunity to witness at this point in time, but they got it wrong at the moment of truth. So if there was ever a more anticlimactic climax and sad response to this question, I really can't imagine what it would be. It's certainly not what we would have expected if we were following the account of the story, but we get something entirely different. After everything the processional crowd had seen and understood, the best answer they can arrive at is that Jesus is a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, let's be gracious to their response. Maybe what they saw was Jesus as the end times prophet, uh, as, uh, as the end times prophet that Moses had spoken about in Deuteronomy, chapter 18, 15 to 18. There is clearly going to be a prophet that comes. So they're not entirely incorrect in their answer. But it misses the precise symbolism of verses 1 to 9, making it an inadequate, insufficient, and unsatisfactory response. And this is the key thing about the gospel. You can have knowledge of Jesus. You can even agree with that knowledge about Jesus. But unless you submit to that knowledge about Jesus, there is no saving faith. And this is the picture that we see here. They were looking for, anticipating, and desiring a conquering king who would save them from Roman rule, and they missed Jesus' true importance. Namely, that he came to conquer and save them from their sin. And indeed, as we come together next week, we will see that triumph in his resurrection. In short, their response falls short of the response that's required of saving faith. Now, I was going to take us back to um, earlier in the Gospel in chapter 16 to show you what a positive response would be, but I'll just paraphrase that in light of time here this morning. You recall that Jesus is with his disciples, and he's asking them in Matthew 16, 
who do people say that I am? And they give this litany of answers, one of which is a prophet. But then he turns to Peter, and he asks Peter, Peter, who do you say I am? And how does Peter respond? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter got it. And Jesus acknowledged that he got it, right? He said, on this rock, a play on the words of Peter's name, upon this confession of faith that you just made, Peter, I will build my church. So that's what a genuine profession of faith looks like. So as I close today, I want to come back to this question. And I simply want to pose it to everybody here today. And that is, who is Jesus? Who is he? Who is this man? And let me suggest that there are only three possible answers to this question. You may have heard this before. He is either a lunatic, meaning a mentally ill, delusional human being. We've had many of those in our history, have we not? Or he's a liar. That is, he's a false prophet with a false message. Or he is who he claims to be the Lord and Savior of sinners. So it's my prayer today and every day that each of you has satisfactorily settled this question and the answer, with the answer that gives eternal life. So as you go this week, think about this question. It's an important question. It's an urgent question because we don't know how long the Lord is going to give us on this earth. It's also urgent for those around us who don't know the Lord. So as you think about this, think about opportunities as Beth had in her situation to witness to people about this amazing person, Jesus, who has arrived in this week just as it was prophesied he would at exactly the time it said that he would. And he will accomplish in this final week exactly what he and the Father arranged before the beginning of time. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for 